Muslims in Norway are now establishing a masjid and dawah center to enhance the Norwegian dawah. If you donate to this cause, you will inshallah reap the rewards of thousands of Muslims coming back to Islam and many of those who become du'at and invite to Islam. So click the link and donate now and share the video for extra rewards. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? And welcome. Um, on behalf uh, of Islamnet, in fact, who, which is a Norwegian organization, that organization which aims to create bridges between Muslim and non-Muslim communities. They're doing some great work. We are joined with an esteemed, a legendary, uh, you know, professor, Pro Professor Bar Ehrman. Many of you already know who he is, but if you don't know, I'm going to quickly tell you. He's, um, has written or edited 33 books, including six New, New York uh, Times bestsellers, How Jesus Became God, Misquoting Jesus, um, God's problem, uh, Jesus interrupted, forged, and the triumph uh, of Christianity. Bart is uh, James A. Gray, distinguished professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina, uh, Carolina Chapel Hill, where he has taught thousands of students and won numerous awards. Um, you know, Bart's work has been featured in the, in the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the New uh, and Newsweek. He's appeared on National Geographic, CNN, BBC, NBC, uh, Dateline, and many other places as well. Um, how are you uh, today? Professor. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. Thanks. Doing well. <laughs> I, I think many people will know who you are, especially from um, kind of our follower base, because of your kind of work and how it's had an impact uh, on kind of apologetics, whether it's Christian apologetics, um, Islamic apologetics, or otherwise, um, even new atheists uh, reference your work. And so it's, it's really um, a pleasure to have you on. I think the first question I'd like to ask you um, regarding your line of specialism is about the reliability of the New Testament, okay? Um, first and foremost, you, you came to a conclusion in your own life, in your own kind of development, that the New Testament is not reliable. Why did you come to that conclusion? Yeah, you know, and you know, part of, I did come to that conclusion. I started out as a, as a very conservative fundamentalist Christian who uh, believed that every word in the Bible was completely true and that there were no errors of any kind, uh, scientific, geographical, historical, anything. And over time, I came to realize that uh, that, that wasn't right. And in part, it was because I recognized, uh, I finally, I was, op I was open to any point of view, but I came, I came to recognize that in fact, there are discrepancies and, uh, and contradictions in the New Testament, just say between the gospels uh, and their accounts of Jesus, or between uh, what the book of Acts says about Paul, what Paul says about Paul, or about, so there, there are discrepancies, and obviously if there are discrepancies, they, both, both views stated can't, can't be true. So the, the trick is, though, what does it mean to be unreliable? <laughs> I mean, if you've got a, uh, you know, if you've got a friend who, uh, who's giving you directions and about 10% of the time they're wrong. <laughs> you know, you don't know if you can trust him or not, but it's not yeah. that he's like completely unreliable. It's just that you have to figure out when's he, when's he got it right and not. And that's how it is with, that's how it is with the new Testament, especially you've got to figure out where it's right and, and where there are mistakes. And how, how can one figure that out in, in layman's terms? Like if, if now many Christians may be watching this and say, well, they object to this fact and they believe that every word and every sentence of the Bible is in fact inspired by God and that there is, they believe in biblical inerrancy. They don't believe that there's any such thing as an error in the Bible. They'll be very much taken aback by what you're saying and say, we find it objectionable in fact. So what would you do in order to prove to them that this is not the case? Well, you know, that, as I said, that's how I started out too. I, when I graduated from high school, I went to uh, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, which is a, it's a bastion of fundamentalism. And I was completely, I was completely sold for years that this is absolutely, there is not a word wrong in the Bible. Um, it was finally when I started, I, I learned Greek so I could read the New Testament in Greek. And then I learned Hebrew so I could read the Old Testament in Hebrew. And I started, and I started really studying these texts very closely. And I started finding that there are, uh, you know, there, there are discrepancies. I mean, Mark will say one thing and Matthew will say something else. And it's the opposite thing. <laughs> and right. You don't know this unless you really look closely. But when you do that, then you see this. And so, so 
yeah, how do you go about finding out what's right? Well, you do it the way any historian finds out what happened in the past. I mean, if you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln or the Emperor Constantine or whatever, Churchill, you, 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 you have to, historians look at all the evidence, they consider who's writing it, they consider how close it is to the source, they consider how many sources they have, they see if they're consistent with each other, they, they uh, you know, they, and they try to work out what, what most plausibly happened. And that's all you can do with the New Testament, too. You treat it like a historical source if you want to know what happened historically. I mean, uh, just a bit of my background. That at one point when I was um, actually auditing a course at the University of Oxford doing um, on text criticism, it's not something I actually specialize in myself, but I did audit a, a text criticism course as part of my um, applied um, applied uh, theology masters. And... I knew for a fact that I was well over my kind of people were on a different level. I mean, you have to have, yeah. like you said, language skills. And I said, this is a specialism in and of itself. You need to have language skills. There were, you know, polygots, people that had many different languages under their belt. Like you said, Hebrew and, and Greek and sometimes other languages as well. And so I do really respect the level of work that comes into, you know, the, your line of um, specialism. Uh, well, someone has to learn these languages and then manuscript uh, kind of analysis and, and, and looking at trying to draw inferences from it and stuff like this is it really is uh, the work of especially and you've been doing this for that many years so obviously um it was only then really when i started to realize how heavy this was in terms of uh, being able to be a great text text critic it's not something that someone could just do in, in a year or two it's something that one must actually dedicate a considerable chunk of their life but I'm, I'm wondering why you decided to do so because when i was looking at some of the videos about your story you left christianity because of this reason from what i understand but what kept you interested in this topic so um what i so i got i got interest i got interested in text criticism so some people may not know exactly what that means it doesn't really just mean interpretation of text as you said it has to do with manuscripts you with the new testament uh, we have thousands of manuscripts, but they have many, many differences between them. And so we, since we don't have the originals, we have to look at these manuscripts to find out what the, what the authors originally wrote. And so text criticism is not deciding whether what the authors wrote was true or not. <laughs> it's just finding out what did they actually write. And it's not just the New Testament. It's every book from antiquity is like this. So every, every you know, Shakespeare is like this, or I mean, Chaucer, I mean, everybody, all these books, you've got to figure out what the author wrote. So I got interested in that because I, I believed that the original words were inspired by God. <laughs> and so I wanted to know what the words were since we have all these manuscripts that have differences in them. So that's what got me going. What kept me going is um, was somewhat different. I actually did leave the faith about 25 years ago. I stopped being a Christian. And it wasn't actually because of the scholarship. It the reason I left the faith was, um, was not because I knew the Bible had mistakes. or I knew that for a long time. And I stayed a Christian for a long time knowing that. What that made me leave the faith was being, I got to a point where I just couldn't believe that there was a God who was in the world who was active, a, a loving, powerful God who's active in the world, given all of the massive suffering that people experience. I just thought, you know, I just don't believe it anymore. But then why do I continue being a New Testament scholar? I'm passionate about the New Testament. I'm passionate about the study of early Christianity. And largely it's because it is such an important historical phenomenon Christianity took over the entire Roman Empire and became the religion of the Western world. Basically, I mean, the, the dominant religion of the Western world. And there's still more Christians in the world than anything else. It's like, whoa, it's really important. And the New Testament is at the very root of it. It's the foundation of it. And so it's important for me to understand what the foundation is and to try and teach other people what the foundation is, because most people really don't know. Uh, and so that's why I'm passionate about it. Well, I mean, uh, your work, as, as I've said, is, is not just applicable or relevant to kind of Christians. It's very much relevant to Muslims as well, because, as you know, in the Islamic faith, um, Muslims believe in Jesus Christ as well. And obviously there's competing narrative ideas as to who Jesus Christ was, in fact. And um, the main, I would say, the fundamental difference between the kind of Muslim faith and the Christian faith in this regard is that muslims view jesus christ as a prophet and a message uh, as a messenger a prophet and a messiah but not as god or the son of god in fact they, they you know the quran is very explicit that he doesn't um he doesn't claim to be a he doesn't claim to be a god himself in fact th th this is seen as a fabricated or some kind of a contrivance 
on the on the narrative and really the the islamic idea is that there cannot be someone it's not intelligible or conceivable or pardonable uh, for someone with a date of birth to be referred to as god anyway so jesus christ will be disqualified from from that perspective but this is why there's there's a lot of interest i think from the muslim community on um on, on your kind of work because it's, it's, it's historical work that's being done and many muslims feel that kind of your vision of or your conclusions your historical conclusions of who jesus christ is is more commensurate with at least the muslim uh, idea than it is with uh, the christian one to what extent would you agree or disagree with that notion um, I would say that my views um, don't fit in well with traditional Christianity in a lot of ways. I, I wouldn't say that they line up well with um, with the uh, Muslim view. They, they. Um, I mean, for example, I, you know, I believe I really do think Jesus was crucified <laughs> and that he really was dead and buried. Uh, and um, so there are there are there are differences. And there, you know, there there are a lot of Christ there are a lot of people identify as Christian who do not think that it's important to think that Jesus was physically raised from the dead or that he is literally God. Uh, there are people who identify as Christian with those views. And so, you know, for me, I, I don't get involved with the theological controversies because I'm not theological. I don't believe in God at all. And so I'm not interested in whether Jesus was the son of God because I don't think there was a God. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, but I am interested in the historical question and uh, you know, what, how was Jesus understood during his lifetime? Uh, and uh, this, this is this topic of this webinar that I'm, I'm doing on Sunday. It, did Jesus think he himself was God? Did he think he was God? It's a, and I treat this as a historical question. You know, of course, on a theological ground, grounds, Christians would say, yeah, well, of course he did. Uh, but my, my question is, how do you establish that if you're doing it from a historical perspective? Like without faith, with you know, you're you. It's not that you're Christian or anti-Christian or some other religion. It's just like oh, you know, just historically, how would you go about showing if Jesus thought he was God? And I think actually historians can say something about this that that will be surprising to a lot of people. So what is? I mean, from once again reading your book, misquoting Jesus and other things. Uh, my understanding is that your conclusion is that Jesus Christ was a messianic prophet. Right, that at least that what he claimed he was, not not a god or the or necessarily the son of God, but the, um, not a god. To what extent is that a true representation of your beliefs? Uh, yeah, I think. I mean, I think it's interesting in the New Testament that Jesus does claim to be God um, in uh, the Gospel of John, yeah. which is our our final our final gospel. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the historical Jesus uh, considered himself to be a divine being at all. Um, I think he, he thought that he was a son of God in the sense that he was specially chosen by God. And then I think Jesus really did think he was going to be the Messiah, the, the future deliverer, of, the future king of Israel. Um, that I mean, that is, after all, why they crucified him for, for yeah. saying that he was the king of, king of Israel. And so uh, I, I, I think that that's historically right. But that the, the Messiah was not supposed to be a divine figure. The Messiah was a human um, yes. and prophets were humans. And Jesus certainly understood himself as a prophet and as a teacher and probably as the Messiah and a son of God in the sense that other people were sons of God. I mean, the, the king of Israel was the son of God. He's called the son of God. And and priests were sometimes or prophets. They could be called the son. And so I don't think that Jesus thought that like he existed before he was born or that he was born of a virgin. I, I don't think that any of that's probably right. Well, I, what, what I've read from you and also heard from you in some lectures and debates and also in your books is that you differentiate between the Gospel of John, as you've, you just have now, which is obviously the most uh, the latest edition, um, and then obviously the synoptic Gospels as well. And you, you make this uh, case, from what I remember from reading uh, your books, that there has been a development uh, in, to a higher Christology. And uh, in John, as you've mentioned, it seems like the author of the Bible you mentioned um, believes that Jesus is actually divine, but that in the Synoptic Gospels, we we're talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is less uh, prominent. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that development? Yeah. So what 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 I would say is that the, these four Gospels are all distinct from one another. They they all have their own message, their own perspective on Jesus. Uh, and it's not necessarily that these perspectives are uh, at odds with each other or contradictory. I mean, I think, I think Matthew and Luke have very different views of who Jesus was, but I, they're not necessarily contradictory. 
but I do think that John stands out uh, as as you know they're all different, but John is probably the most is the most different, um, and pretty much for the reason you're saying. I my my view is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that and you know as you listeners know they they call those the synoptic gospels because they're they're so similar they tell many of the same stories sometimes they tell them word for word the same and so you can put them in columns next to each other and read them together because you so you can see them together so that's what synoptic means you can see them together uh, john has a whole different set of stories and i i think that all of these gospel authors i think all of them think that in some sense jesus is god but it's only in the Gospel of John that Jesus goes around saying things like, I and the Father are one, or before Abraham was, I am, or if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. <laughs> These are quite, quite st amazing statements. Um, but from early on in Christianity, Christians knew that John was different, and they usually called it the spiritual gospel, because rather than kind of the nuts and bolts of what he was doing in his life, it's more theologically oriented. And that's a view that that scholars today confirm and I that I agree with. It does though, and I think it's very it's extremely valuable to Christians as a theological expression of who Jesus is. But my question is, is it historical in the sense that is this really what Jesus is this the kind of thing Jesus was saying about himself? Yes, and and, and the point that you make also in some of uh, once again I'm referencing you a lot here because obviously we've consumed a lot of your material. And I, and I advise a lot of people to to do the same. I think your books are very lucid, very well written, very well structured, and actually accessible to lay people as well, uh, which I think you do an effort in making that the case. But um, you also make this case as, uh, that we, when you talk about synoptic reports and you talk about kind of comparing synoptic reports with other reports, maybe that of John or other, other books in the New Testament, that one of the things that really cast aspersion on your or on the reliability of the Bible according to you was the fact that not only are there different variants of the Bible but they were contradictory variants so you have the same story here being um, reported in two different ways and uh, and you have direct contradictions which if you were to take both stories on face prima facie value you would have to bring forward some very unfeasible inconceivable set of kind of scenarios in order to make sense of both of them together um, to what extent is this articulation representative of your position? Yeah. No, that, that is my view. I, you know, if somebody believes in inerrancy, as a lot of a lot of pe people do, a lot of Christian evangelicals tend to believe that the Bible has no no mistakes in it. Um, it's very hard to show them that that's a problematic view because you, if you're at that level, if you think that the Bible cannot have any mistakes in it. Then, if you're if you're shown a mistake, then you just refuse to admit it's a mistake, and that you you think either it can be reconciled in some way, or that there's something we just don't understand about it, or you know we have, and and so that that's fine. But and that's how I that's how I was too. What really got me were not the big differences, like John has Jesus portrayed like this and Matthew like that. The big differences, in, kind of weirdly, you can you can explain it's the little details that, get, that tend to get somebody and in my case it was just the tiniest tiny little thing Can you give us some examples of what you're talking about i'll give you the example yeah. that blew it apart for me i didn't know yeah. it was going to blow it apart but it was like a little chink in the armor and so what <laughs> happened was i was in, i was in seminary i was in i was in seminary and i was i was taking a, a semester-long course on the gospel of mark uh where we read it in Greek, we studied in Greek, spent the whole semester just studying Mark in Greek, and we had, and I believe that the Bible had no mistakes in it at the time. We had to write a a term paper for the class. My professor was this very devout, pious Christian. He wasn't a fundamentalist, but he had a he had a high view of Scripture, and and um, so. I, I decided to do this passage in Mark chapter uh, two, where Jesus' disciples are going through the fields eating grain on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees see them doing this, and they're all upset because it's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to be harvesting grain on the Sabbath, and they're doing that. So they tell Jesus to tell the disciples to cut it out, and and Jesus says to them, "Look, don't you remember what happened in Scripture when uh, Abiathar was the high priest?" 
when David went into the temple and he and his disciples, they ate, they, they ate the showbread that was only for the priests. And he goes on to say, you know, that, that the Sabbath is made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. And so it's okay, you know, to satisfy your hunger on the Sabbath. And so he tells, so my paper though was on this little detail. He says that this happened when Abiathar was the high priest. Ah. Because in the Old Testament, when this happens in the book of Samuel, it's not Abiathar. It's his oh. father, Ahimelech, who's the high priest. Oh, yes. And so I wrote a 30-page paper showing wow. on the basis of a detailed analysis of Mark's grammar that even though he said Abiathar, he didn't mean Abiathar. He meant Ahimelech. <laughs> <laughs> Is that paper anywhere on the internet we can look at? It? <laughs> this big paper, my, my professor really liked it. He gave me an A on it, but at the bottom of it, he simply said, maybe Mark just made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that's easier than a 30-page grammatical explanation. <laughs> Yeah, maybe Mark just made a mistake. <laughs> so once I said that, it's like it just, I started realizing, you know, there could be a little mistake. And then I found another little mistake. And then another, and pretty soon I started finding them all over the place. Oh my God. And so it kind of blew apart this idea. Well, that sometimes, you know, in, in, in academia and scholarship, sometimes we forget that the, you know, the path of least resistance is sometimes the yeah. most, uh, <laughs> exactly, is, is the best and most. Uh, convincing one but i'll tell you i mean um, i'm not sure if you've kind of come across how this works uh, at least from an islamic perspective but th there's two things which i think may be of interest to you in islam one of them is um that one of the necessary conditions for revelation according to the quran is that there are no internal contradictions and this is very clear so in the quran it's mentioned you know in chapter 4 verse 92 that if this got, if this book was from other than god there would have been in it they would have found in it many contradictions, inconsistencies. And so there's this kind of um, falsification challenge to try and find contradictions within the Quran as a means of disproving it. Because had it not been from God, then this would be uh, a problem. Now, with the hadith, which is, I think, more of a kind of open uh, you know, game on, the, on these kind of things, um, th there's actually a very strict step-by-step -step process on if there are contradictions between hadith, what to do, and um, and the harmonizing method. And in fact, one of the, the great scholars, Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, who is one of the great scholars of um, hadith, he mentions a six-stage process. And he says, look, you know, you, you first try and harmonize it, you do this, you do that, and if it's conceivable. By the end of it, what happens is just what you've said. You have to reject one and accept one. If there are two contradictory hadiths talking about the same event, one of them has to be rejected and one of them has to be accepted because it's the impossibility of both of them being true, even despite the fact that both of their chains may be correct because we have something called the chain of narration where many different things have to be in line in order for the chain to be um, to acceptable and for it to be historical. And for this reason, many people don't know is that the, the authenticated hadiths are much less, much more few in number and compared to the, the inauthentic hadiths. So we have literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of hadiths, or, you know, statements of the Prophet, which have been rejected, have been seen as weak or unreliable or maldua, which is fabricated or matruk, or there's different classifications. And a significant minority, or even, you know, you can say a minority, generally speaking, of those hadiths constitute what is referred to as the sunnah, which is, you know, the, the authentic hadiths and so on notably in the books of al-Bukhari and Muslim and so on. So I, I do think that there's something to look at there if, you, if you're interested in maybe um, it's not text crit criticism, but the kind of the historical approach of Islam um, as a point of comparison, maybe, to see. Yeah. If, uh, have you ever looked at that yourself and, and been interested in that? Uh, I'm, not, I, you know, I'm not a Quran scholar, obviously, yeah. but I, I, I would like to say a couple of things about it. One yeah. is that um, it... Um, it does seem to me that if a book is without contradictions, that 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 has no bearing on whether it comes from God or not. Um, and so, you know, and so it's not impossible for a human to write a book without contradictions because many people do. And so there, I've had phone books that are inerrant, but I certainly don't think God gave them. <laughs> and so and so uh, uh, another thing is that um, I, I, you know, as a good Westerner who uh, was raised in, uh, without knowing it, was raised in Greek philosophical traditions, including Aristotelian logic, I agree that two contradictory things can't be true. Um, uh, historically, 
But I will also say that that is a product of my education and that there are some areas that Aristotelian logic does not apply. Uh, for example, if I were a Christian, I would still believe in quantum mechanics. <laughs> but I mean, quantum theory, <laughs> there, there are, I mean, it just does not work on the kind of logical level. And to say, so to say that it can't be from God, you know, if I were a Christian, I'd say the world was created by God and, and the quantum mechanics does not, you know, it's contra yes. they're contradictions. They're just part of the, the business. And so, um, so I would, I would, I would also say that the, the other no, thing I with that point, just, just to, I would agree with, you know, what you said about phone book, the phone book is almost good. Uh, what it is usually, um, the way we kind of um, put, kind of put this forward is that there's the difference between necessary and sufficient conditions. So yes. the way yes, we would put it is that it's a necessary condition for a book from God not to have contradictions. It's not sufficient for it to be yes. without contradictions. I know, I know a lot of Christians who disagree with that because yeah. that's an assumption about what kind of book God could write. And yes. for example, I know I know theologians who would say Christian theologians who would say that yes. Matthew and Mark contradict at this point, but it's because Matthew's trying to make this important theological statement and Mark's trying to make that important theological statement. And both theological statements are true, even if they're not both historical. Yes. No, but then the question is, if it's both, is I mean, we're, we're talking more about people that take the, the high view of Scripture and biblical inerrancy rather than kind of Christian scholars that come afterwards yeah. and, yeah, and talk right. about, it, like, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. for yeah. example, uh, yeah, those who say, I'm not talking yeah. about, uh, yeah. there are many. Well, if, you, know. if, if you hold yeah. to inerrancy, then the contradiction thing's a big problem. Yeah, not those scholars, um, like Karl Barth, uh, or Karl Barth, I was reading, it's got your kind of, first name and his surname but obviously um he was talking about himself the vulnerabilities of the bible and yeah. if you look at his kind of like um uh, his works and stuff and many scholars in the christian tradition have have noticed this I, we're not saying that all scholars you know obviously all of christianity is characterized by the fact that people believe in biblical narrative is uh, typically a um, evangelical belief uh, system but th this is where I think the argument is most potent. Uh, your type yeah. of argument, yes, and yes, yes. We would say our type of argument as well, because yeah. if, if you hold that everything in the Bible is um, inspired by God, the All-Knowing One, that would suggest that if there are contradictions between two propositions uh, on the same kind of event that's being referred to, then either God got it wrong, which is uh, absurd, or that the, those who wrote on behalf of Him got it wrong, which is more plausible. Uh, see, I don't agree with that because I think they could get it right theologically, but not get it right historically. Mm -hmm. I, like my view, my, the, the reason for pointing out that that you can be, the, the reason why I pointed this out about theologians isn't really to make a point about academics. It's a point of saying you can still be a Christian and not be a fundamentalist. Yes, of course. Um, yes, yes. You know, you meant you mentioned the neo the neo atheist, and it's I think one of the big problems with the with some of the neo atheist authors is they 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 assume that oh, if, everyone's evangelical. Yeah, if it's you know oh yeah. well, if you're not a fundamentalist you're not a Christian. It's like what exactly, yeah. you know or like they think that all religions fundamental you know uh, Islam Judaism is like they have this whole thing about like it's and no I mean most people religious are not like that and so I think you're right. But here's what I would say on this point though. I mean. I think there's a reason why evangelicals talk about biblical inerrancy and they hold to it. And the reason is that if if God is being fair with people, right, then the accessibility to guidance that the primary audience has to um, the revelation um, shouldn't be disparate from the um, accessibility of guidance to people that come in later generations because then that would be an advantage of the 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 prior people to the kind of later people and then questions of well if god wanted me to follow guidance and the guidance itself is corrupt then what kind of guidance is it and i i think that muslims would agree with that sentiment to, to a large extent like the idea that if guidance is to be sent to a people it needs to be complete and it needs to be preserved um and and so from that angle i understand where the kind of if you want to call them that fundamentalists or kind of evangelical christians are coming from the, the only problem, as I said, as you said, sorry, is, yeah, it's true to say that in Christianity, not all people are characterized by um, believing in biblical inerrancy, like the, many Catholics, many, many different types of Protestants don't believe in it. And in which case they have an easier case to make when it comes to sorting out these contradictions, but then they have a more difficult case to make as to why God hasn't revealed his book in a preserved way such that we can all have access to it in a very similar manner.
Well, I know I know this is a this is a, a, a an important uh, argument that uh, apologists use for Islam. My view about this is, as somebody who is not either Christian or Muslim, is that um, that it doesn't make sense to me for humans to say what God has to do. If God wants to make a revelation, it has to be this, this, or that. It's got to be clear. It's got to be consistent. There cannot be contradictions. There cannot be manuscript problems. I mean, who says? I mean, God, I mean you're talking about somebody who's beyond your imagination. Well, so what we would reply to that, right, is that we would say, otherwise it would be indistinguishable from human speech. There has to be something within revelation which distinguishes it from human speech so as to act as an evidence. Yes, I know that. I know that's your argument, yeah. but I'm saying, who says it has to be? You are. No, if it's not, then the issue would be then that anyone can claim prophecy or prophethood, right? Anyone can claim prophethood. Well, but Christians say that's what the that's what the Christians say. What Muslims are doing? They're just claiming things for themselves. This is what we would say. We would say that in in the past, prophets came. Um, this is actually what Ibn Hajar said. The same scholar that I've mentioned before, the Hadith scholar. He said that in the past, people came, prophets came with kind of visual miracles. So things like splitting the sea, we believe in that, right? So Moses came and he, he turned the stick into a snake and all this kind of... So we, they did that. And he said the difference between those prophets and those who came after, or the, the final prophet, who's we believe Prophet Muhammad, um, but he came with something that can be analyzable in our times. So if, if it didn't have that analyzable quality, then that once again, in terms of evidentiary basis, it would be lacking. So in, in, let me put it in this way. So for example, if, if I was there at the time of Moses and I saw him split the sea, and then I go and tell my uh, grandchild about that, my grandchild has a, less, a lesser kind of accessibility to that miraculous nature of splitting the sea than I do. And so therefore the evidence that prophets are meant to provide to evidence their prophethood would be disparate from me to another person. But if it's analyzable in a sense that you can distinguish it from human speech and you can do so in all times and places, then from that perspective, it becomes something which anyone in any generation can look at and distinguish from human speech. So, so for, for us, just to kind of uh, finish this point, there's two things. There's what, what we call necessary conditions, things like that there, there should be because... Uh, Usually, in like you've mentioned, not just Greek logic, but any kind of logical L1, you know, propositional logic, that, uh, you know, a, a contradiction is false. It's, it's a false statement. And so the fact that it doesn't fulfill the logical criterion for truth, if, if something which does not fulfill the logical criterion for truth presents itself as uh, God's words or the, the words of the all-knowing one, that should have, and then God decides to punish somebody because they're not following it. It's less voracious than someone saying, well, actually, someone God is punishing someone uh, for not believing in something, which um, there are evidences of, both necessary evidences, as we mentioned, preservation and inconsistent, but then also then the sufficient evidences of so prophecies. We believe in uh, prophecies of the Quran, you know, um, prophecies of the, um, the, the Hadith, things that will happen in the future that the Prophet told us about and so on, which uh, you can read a book called The Forbidden Prophecies. I can't go into it now because this will discuss the discussion. But things like that, which will act as um, sufficient conditions now to satisfy the probabilistic reasoning of a human being. Uh, so somebody in the 7th century can kind of look at that and someone in the 20th century can look at that. And so this would be the argument that we would put forward. Yeah, no, I know. I know. And I don't, I don't buy it. I think that it's based on assumptions about yes. what's necessary. And you might say that logic is logic, but logic is not logic. I mean, anthropologists have clearly shown that, in fact, in different cultures, what counts as logic in one culture does not count as logic in another. So somebody else could come along and say the necessary condition for truth is that it's revealed as soon as human beings appear on earth, because it is necessary that God always had the same truth. And if he doesn't always have the same truth, so it has to go back to Adam and Eve or it's not true because it's necessary for God to reveal it to everybody who's ever lived. So people could say all sorts of things about what's necessary, but they're just saying what their tradition has taught them or what they, you know, what makes sense to them uh, or what is logical in their point of view. I, I share your logic, but you know, the law of non-contradiction is not, is not written into the nature of reality. It's written into, uh, it's written into our particular Western philosophical tradition. I, I don't think it's specific to the Western tra uh, tradition. Because, Where are you going to find the law of contradiction, the law of non-contradiction before? 
uh, before Greek philosophy. Well, I mean, in terms of codification, right? I mean, I would agree that Aristotle maybe, you know, he codified it in the organon or something like that. And that's probably it one just, of the it's first... so much a part of us. We can't imagine somebody not agreeing with it. Yeah, yeah. But, but we can't is, imagine you... quantum physics either. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I agree with you. But the thing is, if if we do this, um, what what is referred to sometimes as uh, logical skepticism, if we do this exercise, then unfortunately, a lot of our what you're doing and what I'm doing in our respective fields will collapse because one of one of the presuppositions of any scientific or historical enterprise are these laws, the laws of non-contradictions, the laws of um, predictability, or whatever it may be. But, you know, th these things are mentioned. So if the inductive approach, like, you know, if, when you're doing your work, you rely upon a select few uh, or a select number of manuscripts and uh, data that you can then generalize or com make conclusion. But uh, what I was going to say was, yeah, so this is where we would maybe disagree or agree. Yeah. But I will leave it to the kind of viewers to, 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 to make their mind up on that. Um, going back on the Bible and um, and tell, tell us more about that maybe before we end is... I want you to tell me something about who, in your opinion, maybe uh, put it in this very blunt way, who was Jesus Christ? Who, according to you, was Jesus Christ? So I think uh, I think Jesus was a completely human being. I think yes. that he was a uh, he was, uh, from a little town called Nazareth. It was a small little hamlet. He was impoverished. He was yes. um, he was probably a day laborer of some kind. Uh, and he was some kind of religious genius, I think, maybe with a charismatic personality who um, I don't think he was well educated, was probably wasn't educated at all. But he had a gift for uh, insight uh, into uh, matters of religion and understood that he himself had been chosen by God in order to uh, proclaim that God was soon going to intervene in history to destroy all the forces of evil that are creating all the misery and suffering in the world. And God was going to bring in the paradise that the world was supposed to originally have. Uh, There's going to be a kingdom here on earth and people would be raised from the dead in order either to be brought into the kingdom or to be destroyed for all time. And he thought this was going to happen very soon. Um, he offended the authorities um, for a variety of reasons connected with his message. And they, they decided that he was a troublemaker and uh, they arranged for him to be crucified, and they so they executed him. So practically everything we would agree with, except for that last bit there. But we do be, we do believe in a crucifixion of some sorts, uh, though we, the Quran just on that point states that yeah. Yeah. it was basically like in Shubbi Halam. It was uh, it was a crucifixion that was made to appear to them that it was Jesus, but it was not, wasn't actually Jesus. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I could actually talk to you about the crucifixion maybe some other time because it would be another can of worms that we'd be opening. But that's, you know, the Islamic narrative. But on this uh, note, um, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Tell us um, about the uh, seminar that you've got on Sunday. Yeah, so the seminar, um, people can sign up on uh, on Islam.net. Uh, and uh, for it, uh, the, you'll have the website there. And it's going to be uh, dealing from a historical perspective. How do you know what Jesus said? And how do you know whether he called himself God? And um, what kind of evidence is there? Is there evidence for it? Is there evidence against it? And so for me, it's a historical question because whether he called himself God or not, I don't think he was God. <laughs> right, so it's right, not, right. so, but, but I am interested in the question, what did he think about himself and how would you know? So I think, you know, it's for, for, for a Muslim audience, I think this would be very interesting because it's very interesting. Know, it would be, very it does kind of, it coincides with some important aspects of Islam. And for yeah. a Christian audience, it's really important because if Jesus didn't call himself God, if, suppose he did not call himself God. That would not mean he's not God, right? Mm. Uh, I don't. I don't call myself a uh, you know a pain in the neck. <laughs> but doesn't mean I'm not a pain in the neck. <laughs> well, maybe your wife has something to say about that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, and so, and so, but but it is. It would be interesting theologically for people to know if Jesus called himself God, and then they would have to decide what to do with that. So I'm just going to be looking at the historical evidence. What can you say? And and what are the grounds? I, just before before I let you go, I mean, on this point. You do differ with atheists or kind of, I don't say atheists, but minimalists, let's call them historians, who don't believe that Jesus existed at all. No, um, I don't hear that. <laughs> yeah, so what, what would be your most, what would be your strongest evidences to someone who's a skeptic of the existence of Jesus in the first place? 
Well, you know, I wrote a whole book on this <laughs> called Did Jesus Exist? Because it's yeah. the evidence is so overwhelming. This is yeah. not a debated point among experts, whether they're atheists or agnostics or right. Christians or Jews. It's just like, it's not, but there is this group of, a loud group of mythicists who think Jesus didn't exist. And you just wonder how much evidence do you need? I mean, yeah. uh, uh, you know, so in my book, I go through, like, we have all of these sources of information. I mean, you have these four Gospels, but these four Gospels are based on earlier sources that were all independent of each other. And wow. and you've got an author like Paul, who personally knew Jesus' brother. <laughs> and, he, and he personally knew Jesus' closest disciple, Peter. And it's like, he's not trying to prove Jesus existed. He's just like, Paul, <laughs> it's like... You know, if Jesus' brother didn't exist, you'd think he'd know it. If 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 Jesus, if Jesus had a brother, you'd think his brother would know that he didn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so I, uh, yeah, I I think that they, um, I I just think that it's not a helpful point of view, and that if if you're opposed to Christianity, there are probably more helpful ways to go about it than to say that Jesus didn't exist. You know, if I if I were if I if I ever did, which I, I never would. I mean, I don't believe in attacking any other religions or discounting. But you know, if I wanted to discount Judaism or if I wanted to discount uh, Islam, I wouldn't say, "Well, oh, Muhammad never lived." <laughs> it's like, well, of course he lived. <laughs> it doesn't mean I have to agree with him. <laughs> exactly. It's exactly. This is this is exactly the point. And I think that it's it, it's good that you mentioned that and. You, you do give weighting to extra biblical um, extra biblical sources as well, don't you? So I do. Um, I think there are. I think there is external evidence as well. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, and you're always welcome to come and speak to us and have, exchange ideas. And if you want anything from us, you know, um, about Islam or explaining what well, the foundations of Islam. I mean, a lot of people know it already, but it's a very simple uh, religion. We believe in one God, worshiping one God, and Abraham, Moses, and Jesus to worship in Him. Uh, one God, not all of those prophets. That those prophets came to tell the people to worship one God. And so that's where I think there is there is a kind of line of best fit, if you like, or a flesh that joins where we believe um, what, what we agree on, because what we do agree on is that Jesus was a man and not a God. Obviously, you don't believe in God in the first place. But, but there is a flesh. That, and that's what many people, Muslim people, will be interested in your work um, to either bolster their claims or or at least to try the truth seekers that want to see what, what, what who was this Jesus Christ yeah. that the world is so fascinated with. But I mean, thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Vegard and I'm a Norwegian Muslim convert. I cannot express how grateful I am for Allah to have guided me to Islam. In my country, there are no Islamic schools or Dawah centers that fully operate in my language. A lot of the Islamic programs here are in Urdu, Arabic and Somali. And I don't understand these languages. We new Muslims need a place where we, we really can learn Islam. Alhamdulillah, Allah guided me to the Dawah organization Islamnet who helped me stay firm in my religion. We are now raising funds to establish a Norwegian Masjid and Dawah center that will educate our people about Islam in the Norwegian language. The Prophet wasallam said, whoever builds a Masjid for Allah, Allah will build for him a similar house in Jannah. If you take part in this project, you will inshallah be rewarded for all the new Muslims who learn about Islam and all of the Muslims who learn to give da'wah and every single person who accepts Islam through this center. This will inshallah be an endless ongoing charity for you. And let's not forget, Allah will inshallah build for you a palace in Jannah. As a Norwegian Muslim, Norway is my country and dawah to these people is my responsibility and you are my family please donate for the sake of Allah and build for yourself a house in Jannah and whatever you give Allah will give you more in return and please click on the share button so you can get the reward of everyone who follows you in donating for this masjid may Allah reward you